If you looked at our website, and I won't embarrass you and ask you to raise your hand if you've looked at the website this week, uh, but I hope that you do look at it on a regular basis because I'm doing my best every week to make sure it's updated and wonderful. And uh, I put on there what we're going to talk about over the next uh, couple weeks before we get into Advent, and that is a very short book of the Bible called Jude. Jude. So if you would turn in your New Testaments... To Jude, it is, I'll give you the hint, the secret. It's right before Revelation. So it's the next to last book. And the whole book, the whole letter is 25 verses long. So please turn in your Bibles, just past 3 John, to Jude. And before we read Jude's letter, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Fill our mouths with your praise. Thank you for who you are, what you've done. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. Uh, Let us not just sort of go through another church service, Lord, but speak to us. Change us. Remind us of who you are. And then make us people who are thankful. Not just this coming Thursday during an American holiday. But every day, every minute of every day, may we give thanks to you for who you are and what you've done. Open the eyes of our heart and our minds, Lord. Draw us closer to you. And I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read the whole thing since it's so short. Some psalms are 25 uh, verses long, so it won't take long. Uh, But we're actually only going to focus on the first two verses today, and then we'll look at some of the rest of it next week. But hear the word of the Lord. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, peace, And love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not, dare, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's heir. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness 
and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I pray that you will look at that again this week, maybe once or twice or more. Read through Jude. But Pastor Jefferson, it's Thanksgiving. You should be giving a, a Thanksgiving sermon. Well, yes, I should. We should give thanks in all circumstances, the scripture says. Uh, always rejoicing, always giving thanks every minute of every day, not just on the fourth Thursday or third Thursday, whatever it is, of November every year. So it's not going to be a specifically Thanksgiving sermon. I'm not going to talk about turkey or pilgrims or anything like that. But as you listen carefully, I think you will see that it is a Thanksgiving sermon. Because we can give thanks to God. Because he calls us, loves us, keeps us, and gives us mercy, peace, and love. May we, in our lives... Give thanks to God because he calls us, he loves us, he keeps us, and gives us mercy, peace, and love. Now this starts out by saying, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Well, which James? There's a lot of Jameses that uh, we could... Speaker fell. There's a lot of James that we could, could look at in the Bible. Uh, one of them that could be a possibility as this James is James the son of Zebedee, the brother of, of John. But uh, we find out in Acts chapter 12 that pretty early on, he gets put to death. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. It's probably not likely that he was the one that, that wrote this. The other disciple is James, the son of Alphaeus, and we know almost nothing about him. But there's another James that we do learn about. We learn about him in Galatians 1.19, where Paul is saying who he talked to, and he says, the only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. Well, if we look in the Bible at the book of James, we see that it is written, starts out like this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Isn't that interesting? They both started by saying, I am, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm a servant of the Lord. In humility, they didn't say, hey, I grew up with him too. I'm a servant of him. I'm James' brother. You see, they're both listed in Matthew 13. When Jesus had finished telling these stories and illustrations, he left that part of the country. He returned to Nazareth, his hometown. When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. 
James is listed as a brother. Judas, who also in English could be just plain Jude. So the person who wrote this is the brother of the Lord Jesus. The person who wrote James is the brother of the Lord Jesus. And they did not believe until the crucifixion and the resurrection. We know that because in John chapter 7, it says, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters, and Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. And Jesus himself said in Matthew 13, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. John Piper wrote an article about this, and he gives some pretty compelling reasons for why the brothers didn't probably believe. Number one, can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your older brother? That's a pretty high standard that you have to live up to. And there could have been some jealousy and there could have been some misunderstanding. But what we clearly know is that James and Jude are growing up in the household of Mary and Joseph. Now, scholars think that Joseph probably passed away pretty early or something like that. So we don't know exactly uh, how long he was there. But they're growing up in this household and their older brother is Jesus. And they don't believe in him until crucifixion and resurrection. Something happens in their hearts. Listen to this. Acts chapter 1. The apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. They believe now. They believe, and not only do they believe, but God has called them and inspired them to write down, James and Jude, to write something down. And they start by saying, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Not, hey, I grew up with him and I can tell you stories about some things he did as a kid. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. And if you look that word up in the Greek, it's, it's doulos. And it's probably better translated and is translated sometimes as slave. Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ. The word doulos means one who gives himself up wholly to another's will. One who gives himself up wholly to another will. To another's will. We just got done with the whole ichthus thing where we said that ichthus stands for this statement, Jesus Christ is God's son, the savior. The other early confession of the early Christians was Jesus is Lord. And Jude is saying, Jesus is Lord, I'm not. I will do his will. I will do the will of another. I am a follower of Jesus, and I am a servant or a slave to his will. And then he tells us a little bit more about those who are slaves or servants to his will. And first of all, they are called. To those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. This word in the Greek means invited, appointed. Think of it this way. Hey, where's Tim? Oh, he got called away by his boss. He had to go work. He was appointed to serve. He is called out of something. We have been called out of rebellious humanity. Called out of rebellious humanity to new life, to eternal life as servants or slaves of Jesus Christ. Judas saying, I'm a slave to Jesus the Lord and he has called me out. He has loved me and God the Father. The word there in Greek is agape, meaning good will toward men. 
relationship. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit has this good will toward rebellious humanity. Don't you think that's something to be thankful for? Maybe this is turning into a Thanksgiving sermon anyways. Because the scriptures tell us that in Romans 5, 8, we were still sinners when he gave himself up for us so that we could follow him. Slaves, servants of Jesus Christ are called out of rebellious humanity. There has been goodwill given toward them. He has given his son as an atoning sacrifice. And then it says, kept in Christ. Now your NIV, at least the new version of it, says kept for Jesus Christ. And several of the English translations say kept for Christ. I looked at the Greek. The word for is not there. I'm not sure uh, where they got that. The better thing is kept in Christ. The word kept in Christ and the word kept means um, guarded. King, King James puts it as preserved. This is the one-on-one -on -one defense that you are not getting past. This is the prison cell that's guarded and nobody gets out. It's not like Colonel Clink. You remember Colonel Clink and Hogan's Heroes? He would always say, no one has ever escaped from Starlog 13. Meanwhile, you know they're going out on a nightly basis. This is the real deal. No one escapes because you're guarded. You're kept. And Jude is saying, that's how we are in Christ. He's keeping us. He's preserving us. He's holding on to us. In Christ, we have a new master. We're called out of rebellious humanity. We're loved. We are kept safe. We are kept safe. We are kept eternally for him. We should give thanks for that. I think this is a Thanksgiving sermon. Then verse 2. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. The Greek word means mercy, kindness, or goodwill toward the miserable and afflicted joined with a desire to relieve them. Remember when you were kids and you would play that game, let's play mercy. And you'd grab hands like this and you'd try and destroy the other person and hurt them until they would shout, mercy, give me mercy. And then if you had goodwill toward the miserable and afflicted, joined with the desire to relieve them, you would let go. That's what this word is. Kindness toward miserable rebellious, sinful people. Be yours in abundance. Mercy. Then he says, peace. Love this word. This is the Greek word, arene. This is what the angels pronounce in Bethlehem when they scare the shepherds to death. And they come and they say, peace. It's the translation of the Hebrew word, shalom. Every Sunday at the end of the time, I, I put my hands up and say the blessing. It ends with the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, I'm speaking English. Where it's originally written in the Hebrew, the word is shalom. When they translated Hebrew into Greek, it was arene. And the word means wholeness, harmony. Completeness, tranquility, security, safety. And Jude is saying, may you have the mercy of God. May you have the peace of God in abundance. And finally, love, that agape word again, that good will towards mankind. Be yours in abundance. The King James would say it, be multiplied in your life. I look this word up and it means an increase that is richly given or generously given. In other words, may these things continually be given to you and applied to your life. May you continually be given the mercy of God. May you continually be given the peace of God. May you continually be the, given the love of God, not just once, but every minute of every day. I think we should give thanks for that. I think this is a Thanksgiving sermon, after all. 25 chapters, we'll look a little more next week at some of them, but basically what he's going to tell you is that you need to be careful because there, there will be people that will creep in, that will try and pervert the grace of God and, and make it something it's not. 
And he does some interesting things. He, he quotes in here uh, from some books that are not in the Bible. Uh, he quotes from some Apocrypha books. And uh, people kind of wonder, why did, why did he do that? Well, because people knew these books. These aren't scripture. They're not considered scripture, but they're books people knew. And he quote from them because people would understand them. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But Hanover Church, my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we would give thanks because we have a master that was fully God and fully man, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross and rose again, ascended, we talked about this last week, to the right hand of God the Father and intercedes and pleads for us. He is our master. May we give thanks and do his will. May we give thanks because he has called us to be one of his children. Because he has loved us with the cross. Because he has kept us and he will keep us through the day of judgment. And he will continually bestow upon us mercy, peace, and love. I don't know about you, but I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. We sang just a little bit ago, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Give thanks to the Holy One because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. We sang, This is amazing grace. Oh Lord, I pray that something that was said this morning would resonate in our minds and hearts and that it would just bounce throughout our minds all week and that you would help us to see who you are. And if, if we need that mercy applied to our lives, that we would uh, have it applied. And then that we would apply that to, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to the lives of our family and friends and those that we come in contact with. Lord, that you would apply the peace to our lives. So often things can get rocky in our lives and, and confusing and, and chaotic. And you give us peace and love. And call us and you keep us. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for changing the hearts of James and of Jude to see who you were and to believe in you, to trust you, and to pass that on to the next generation and throughout space and time to us. Thank you for your word. Lord, if there's anyone here that has never bowed their knee to you as the master and said, I want to be your servant. I want to follow you. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to have the hope that, that Pastor Jefferson was telling the kids about. Lord, if they've never done that, I pray that they would simply turn from their own ways. Say, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Make me new. Renew me. Make me a, a new creation. Lord, for those that have bowed their knee to you for, for many years and decades, I pray that you would encourage them beyond belief with that scripture. That mercy and peace and love abound multiplied in our lives and that you would get the glory in all we say and all we do and all we are about and that we would give you the thanks and give you the praise continually more and more because our hope is in you in jesus holy name we pray amen